Okay, on to a new topic. Uh, we're going to consider a special class of matrices called orthogonal matrices. Uh, and we're going to see actually that they form a group. Uh, we'll define orthogonal matrices, look at some of their properties, ways to classify them in particular, and uh, we'll see in fact that they form a group, uh, the orthogonal group of n by n matrices. Our definition is as follows, an n by m matrix with real entries whose rows or columns constitute a set of orthonormal vectors is an orthogonal matrix or a unitary matrix. Now there's, there's no typo in that statement. Uh, it seems they ought to be called orthonormal uh, matrices since their columns or the rows form an orthonormal set of vectors, but this is standard terminology to refer to these vectors as orthogonal vectors on the requirement that either their collection of rows or the collection of columns forms an orthonormal set of row vectors or column vectors respectively. Um, now, whether it's rows or columns will be affected by the dimensions of the matrix if it's not a square matrix. Uh, and as we'll see in this first result, um, it's the smaller of these two dimensions that determines whether it's rows or columns that forms an orthonormal set. And uh, theorem 3.7.1 actually gives us a, a slightly cleaner way to uh, classify uh, matrices as orthogonal. Uh, it gives us a computational way to recognize them, maybe I should say. Okay, uh, let Q be an N by M matrix. Uh, for N less than or equal to M, so for N the smaller of the dimensions, let's see, we're saying there's um, there's fewer rows than there are columns by saying this in matrix Q. Uh, Q is orthogonal if and only if Q times Q transpose equals I sub n, the n by n identity matrix. Okay, um, and this is the identity matrix of the smaller dimensions of the two. And of course that's determined by the product Q times Q transpose. But notice, notice uh, this involves um, I sub n where n is a smaller of the two dimensions of matrix Q. In the second case, if n is greater than or equal to m, we'll still have a conversation involving um, this, uh, an identity matrix determined by the smaller dimension of the two, m in the second case. For n greater than or equal to m, q is orthogonal if and only if q transpose times q equals an m by m identity matrix. Okay, so we had to reverse the order of multiplication uh, from one of these to the other, and things are being driven, it seems, by the smaller of the two dimensions. We'll go through the proof and we'll see the role that that plays. Uh, a square matrix, which actually follows under both of these cases when n equals m. A square matrix Q is orthogonal if and only if Q, Q transpose equals Q transpose Q equals the identity matrix. In other words, a uh, square matrix is orthogonal if and only if it's invertible and its inverse is given by the transpose. Okay, um, let's make a quick little observation and then we'll go through the proof of that. Uh, in sophomore linear algebra, I'm most impressed if your sophomore linear algebra class covered orthogonal matrices. Uh, I've been teaching linear algebra a long time and I don't think there's enough time in a single semester to get quite as far as orthogonal matrices. If you get that far, then something else has to go. Uh, but in my favorite linear algebra book, Fraley and Beauregard's Linear Algebra, orthogonal matrices, let's see what's the setting, uh, an orthogonal real matrix is defined as a square matrix satisfying this condition. So we'll make a comment here shortly about what happens when we don't have real entries. We're, we're here to deal with real entries, uh, but we'll make a passing observation about complex values and matrices. But orthogonal square matrix required to satisfy A transpose A equals the identity. Same kind of thing we had up here. Uh, so that's actually taken as a definition in some settings. Our definition is this thing in terms of um, 
orthonormal rows or orthonormal columns, and that in some sense that's the important property of orthogonal matrices. But theorem 3.7.1 gives us a way to recognize algebraically, computationally, to recognize um, orthogonal matrices uh, by taking that matrix and multiplying it by its transpose on the left or the right, depending on these various cases. Okay, uh, let's verify that. Uh, first, suppose n is less than or equal to m. So we're under these conditions. Uh, if q is orthogonal, then the row rank of q equals the column rank of q, whether it's orthogonal or not, the row rank equals the column rank. Uh, and the smaller of these two dimensions would determine what that rank would be, must be n, the smaller of the two, uh, provided q is orthogonal, so that the um, rows, say, of q are form an orthonormal set. Uh, think of it like this. Let's see, we've got um, n rows and more than n columns. Uh, if we discussed maybe rank in terms of uh, counting pivots, that's a good way to remember how these things compare. Uh, well, you could have at most n pivots because in a matrix with n rows, there ain't room for more than n pivots. So there's why the smaller of the two dimensions drive the conversation. So anyhow, if Q um, has orthonormal rows or columns, it must be the rows. It must be the smaller of the two dimensions. So in this case, it must be that since Q is orthogonal, Q must have n orthonormal rows. <clears throat> it couldn't have more than that. It couldn't be the columns that are orthonormal unless um, n equals m. And then we could just as well have a conversation about columns. We will in the next piece of the proof. So I want to talk about rows though in this case. So let the rows of Q be R1 through R sub n. So these are the um, orthonormal set of row vectors. We're going to look at Q times Q transpose. So we be, will be interested in the columns of Q transpose. Excellent. The columns of Q transpose are simply the transposes of the rows of Q itself. Transpose Q, transpose its rows, that produces columns, which works out perfect for us taking some inner products. So the IJ entry of Q times Q transpose, you take the i row of the first metric, mate, the i row of the first matrix, that's R sub i, and the j column of the second matrix, that's R sub j transposed, rows transposed to columns. Okay, uh, we've got a row times a column. When we do this type of product here, that's exactly an inner product. Um, now, We've seen these inner products written in terms of a vector transposed times a, another vector in general when we were doing the um, inner product stuff. Before the transpose came first, yeah, before we were primarily dealing with column vectors. And here we're not, we're dealing with row vectors. So that's the reason this might look a little bit different from what you've seen in the past. But indeed, well, we got a row times a column, so the product's defined. In fact, it gives us the inner product of R sub i and R sub j, and we won't talk about that because we know these R1 through R sub n's uh, form an orthonormal set. Okay, so then we're getting, uh, when i and j are different, we're getting out zero, that's the orthogonality. When i equals j, we're getting uh, the norm squared of R sub i, say. And these were also unit vectors, so we get out a one under the condition that i equals j. All right, uh, the orthonormality of those rows produces this. So when we take q, q transpose, the ij entry is one, when i equals j, zero otherwise, that's an identity matrix. Just whatever the appropriate dimensions are, uh, q times q transpose would be n by n. Uh, q is n by m. Q transpose is M by N. So yeah, Q times Q transpose would be an N by N matrix. All right, uh, so we're getting out an N by N identity matrix as, as claimed. So if Q is orthogonal, 
then Q, Q trans, <clears throat> or, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong one. If Q is orthogonal, then Q, Q transpose is I sub n. It says if and only if, so we need to take it the other way with this observation about these inner products, it's easy. Uh, conversely, uh, if Q times Q transpose equals I sub n, then the IJ entry of Q, Q transpose is still going to be this inner product, R sub I times R sub J. Uh, now I know the IJ entry of the identity matrix is one when I equals J and zero otherwise. So that's telling you that the inner product is one when I equals J and zero otherwise. And then that's telling you that the rows of matrix Q are an orthonormal set. That is, Q is orthogonal. So that takes care of the if and only if in the first case. So that was this case, N is less than or equal to M. Let's consider the case, N is greater than or equal to M. Okay, whereas we were um, concentrating on rows in this first case, we'll be concentrating on columns in the second one. All right, second, suppose N is greater than or equal to M. Uh, if Q is orthogonal, then similar to what we had above, it must be that Q has M orthonormal columns. Uh, it couldn't have uh, M orthonormal rows because there's too many rows. There's not room for enough pivots, if you like. Um, of course, we could have N equals M, but we can say definitely that Q has M orthonormal columns all right, uh, let those columns be denoted by C1 through C sub M, then the rows of Q transpose, similar to what we did above, as the transpose of these columns. So when we take the product Q transpose times Q, the IJ entry would be uh, I row of Q transpose, that would be C sub I super T, C sub I transpose, times, um, the jth column of the second matrix, the Q matrix. I row times jth column times inner product is how these are computed. Uh, and since we've got an orthonormal collection of columns, we get that zero and one stuff as we did previously. So Q transpose times Q being an M by M matrix must equal the M by M identity matrix. And similarly, uh, if we'll consider Q transpose times Q, we'll still compute those entries, the IJ entries, the inner product of C sub I with C sub J. Now you'll get the ones and the zeros because you know you're assuming it equals an identity matrix. And that'll lead to the um, orthonormal property on the columns of the matrix. And so Q is orthogonal. All right, so let's see, that was uh, two thirds of the claim. The other one was if we had a square matrix. Uh, if Q is a N by N matrix, both of this in the first case involved N something or equal to M. So N equals M was permissible in both of the, both the first and the second case. So uh, both of those cases cover the case when N equals M. And then we could combine both of those to say Q times Q transpose equals an identity matrix, and it also equals Q transpose times Q. And that was the claim before. So we get an if and only if in that as well. Um, what's the dimensions of this identity matrix? Uh, everything in sites uh, square in the, this little setting. So N by N matrices throughout is what we have there. Okay, so returning to the notes. Oops, returning to the notes. Uh, we could well, as observed earlier, take, uh, at least in the square setting, take this as a definition of an orthogonal matrix. Some settings do. I like the way, actually like the way we did it this time. It's, it's the um, orthonormal collection of vectors things that's more interesting than this little weird behavior between um, the inverse and the transpose. If, a uh, passing comment, if we had a matrix Q with complex entries, then things would have to be modified ever so slightly we're taking as our definition of a orthogonal 
matrix with complex entries is the following. We're requiring Q times the Hermitian of Q to equal uh, the N by N identity when N is less than or equal to M or the Hermitian of Q times Q to equal the M by M identity uh, when N is greater than or equal to M. Uh, where this Q super H thing represents the Hermitian. It's the conjugate transpose. Now, if these entries, these complex entries were actually real, this conjugation wouldn't do anything. Conjugation of a complex number you're familiar with, I trust. So if we started with real entries, then the conjugate stuff wouldn't do anything. And this superscript of an H could would just represent transpose if we had real entries. So in the uh, event that we had real entries, this says the same thing that we've deduced upstairs in theorem 3.7.1. Uh, we're not going to deal with complex entries. Uh, I'm a little surprised if anything gentle put that comment in. Maybe I, I put that comment in. I got no problem dealing with complex entries in a, in a matrix. I got no problem dealing with field entries in a matrix. Um, but things become a little bit different uh, in this setting of orthogonal matrices if you allow complex entries. Most of this stuff, if you change over to complex entries, things become more complicated by requiring the introduction of a complex conjugate somewhere. Inner products have to be modified with a complex conjugate uh, if we use complex numbers. Okay, uh, corollary 3.7.2 for Q a square orthogonal uh, matrix. Uh, the determinant of Q is plus or minus one. Uh, for Q an N by M orthogonal matrix with N greater than or equal to M, the inner product of Q with itself, we define inner products of matrices. Claim is equals M, that's the number of columns of matrix Q. Uh, recall, we define the inner product of uh, two matrices of the same size just by taking products of corresponding entries and summing them up. We did it by taking um, inner products of columns and adding the result up there, but it's effectively multiply every entry of this thing by the corresponding entry of that thing and add them up. Just like you do with regular old inner products of, matrix, of vectors in RN. Uh, second claim, we'll just go through both of the proofs. Uh, now, every permutation matrix is orthogonal. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about permutation matrices. Uh, but first, okay, uh, for Q, a square orthogonal matrix, the determinant is plus or minus one. Okay. Uh, first, Let's take the determinant of Q times Q transpose. You know by theorem 3.71, if we've got an orthogonal matrix, uh, Q times Q transpose equals the identity. I could take Q transpose times Q for that matter, since we're dealing with a square matrix here. I have to be dealing with a square matrix to talk about determinants. Eh? Uh, but determinant of Q, Q transpose, Q, Q transpose equals I, so it's the same as the determinant of I. Uh, the determinant of an identity matrix, of course, is one. Uh, the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants, theorem 3.2.4. So we can take the determinant of Q, Q transpose and write it as the determinant of Q times the determinant of Q transpose. The determinant of the identity matrix is one. Uh, the property of determinants, theorem 3.1.A, I guess, was that uh, the determinant of a matrix and its transpose are the same. So we can replace this determinant of Q transpose with another determinant of Q to give us determinant of Q, that's a number, square it, must equal one, take a square root, both sides, determinant of Q must be plus or minus one as claimed. Uh, so that gives us a determinant property of orthogonal matrices. Of course, they have to be square or we couldn't have a determinant conversation. In the second case, we're having a different conversation. We're having a, I guess, an inner product conversation. It says, let the columns of N by M orthogonal matrix Q, 
uh, where n is greater than or equal to m as part of the situation here, uh, b, uh, c sub 1, c sub 2 through c sub m. Then the inner product of those matrices were defined as, I said you just multiply the corresponding uh, entries together and um, sum them up. It was actually defined in terms of take the um, dot products of the columns, that's how it was defined. So when j equals one, we've got um, the first column transposed times the first column. Uh, it's the inner product of the first column with itself. And here we're treating vectors as column vectors as we commonly did, as I observed recently, you know, that previous proof wasn't. The transpose, you, you're used to seeing it on the first vector when we write inner products in terms of these transposes. Uh, but notice we're summing from j equals one to m. So we're just summing over the columns. All right. Um, this gives us, this is the definition of inner product. This gives us simply a sum of these inner products. And uh, let's see, Ooh, uh, the inner product of C sub J with itself, that's just the norm squared of C sub J. We've got an orthonormal collection of vectors. All right, all them column vectors, they're unit vectors. So we get a one, one squared, M times. So we get one plus one plus one M times equals M. Claim was the inner product of Q with itself uh, equals M. There you go. A uh, little funny observation here. We had an orthonormal collection of column vectors. You know, we didn't really use the orthogonality part, uh, at least directly in this computation. Uh, we just used the fact that they were unit vectors in this computation. Um, we're maybe not taking uh, advantage of the full glory of um, having an orthonormal collection of columns here. We're really just taking advantage of having um, unit vectors, it looks like. And let's see, lastly, for proof from this section, whoops, claim is every permutation matrix is orthogonal. Okay, permutation matrices. That was a, was a product of um, row exchanges, a product of elementary matrices related to row or column uh, interchanges. So um, we'll ultimately have to consider a product of a bunch of elementary permutation matrices, a product of a bunch of row interchanges, say, or column interchanges. So we'll uh, actually establish the result for a single permutation, elementary permutation matrix, and then every permutation matrix is a product of elementary permutation matrices. So first, uh, form the elementary permutation matrix E sub P Q uh, from an N by N identity, uh, permutation matrices, uh, as well as any elementary matrix, they're square matrices, say N by N. So form E sub P Q, my notation, I don't think that's in the book, uh, from I sub N by interchanging rows P and Q of I sub N. We're taking I sub N, swapping, row P and row Q to produce this elementary permutation matrix. Let's say its entries are E sub I, J. All right, so let's see, we're gonna try to show that uh, this E sub P, Q matrix is an orthonormal matrix. And we'll do so by taking it and multiplying it by its transpose. All right, uh, so what you've done in making this E sub P, Q matrix is you got yourself um, almost an identity matrix. All the entries are the same in this matrix as they are in the identity matrix, except in the pth row and the qth row. And there, they're not that different. So what we have uh, is E sub i j equals zero and E sub i i equals one whenever i is not p or q, whenever i is in the set one through n take away set, set, remove, set minus is a LaTeX command, taking away P and Q. As long as we stay away from the P and Q row, we got ourselves like an identity matrix. What happens um, in the P row of E sub P Q? 
Okay, well, the pth row of E sub PQ is going to look like the tooth row of the identity matrix. So when I equals P, we've got, you know, same idea here in IJ entry, we've got uh, E sub PJ equals zero. When J doesn't equal Q, it's behaving like the tooth row of the identity. And when J does equal Q, that is when we look at E sub PQ, we get out one interchange the roles of P and Q, and that's what happens in the, um, in the Qth row. Similarly, uh, in the Qth row, E sub Qj equals zero when J doesn't equal P, and E sub Qp equals one. All right, uh, so like an identity matrix, except in the P and Qth rows, and even there we get a whole bunch of zeros, all but one time we get a zero. All right. Uh, so if we look at uh, the transpose of E sub PQ, I want to describe what those elements look like. So that's just um, re-expressing what's observed up here in terms of uh, I's and J's and P's and Q's, uh, but in terms of the transpose matrix. All right, you transpose an identity matrix, you get an identity matrix. The bulk of this thing up here was like an identity matrix. So the bulk of this thing down here will be like an identity matrix. So in other words, E sub IJ super T equals zero, as long as we stay away from the P and Q row. Uh, and get, I, we get ones along the diagonal, as long as we stay away from the P and Q row. Uh, for I equals P, okay, we know that E sub PJ equals zero from above. I equals P, E sub PJ equals zero. We want to relate that to the transpose. So we'll get E sub JP super T, right? The super T means swap the indices from, from the un super T matrix, untranspose matrix. All right, so we get E sub JP super T equals zero. Um, for J not equal to Q, for J not equal to Q, I'm just matching up with this line here. Uh, and up here we had E sub PQ equals one. So down here we'll have E sub PQ equals one. That translates into the, um, the transpose matrix as E sub QP super T equals one. I won't bore you with the details, but it's a similar story when we look at I equals Q. Okay, so I'm just then borrowing these properties from this little sentence here and expressing it in terms of the superscripted T entries. All right, so uh, let's look at the IJ entry of E sub PQ times E sub PQ transpose. Where are we? We're trying to show E sub PQ is an orthogonal matrix. We're trying to show, by theorem 3.7.1, we're trying to show this is an appropriate sized uh, be n by n is the appropriate size. I'm trying to show this is an uh, identity, an n by n identity. Okay. Well, the ij entry, you simply take the uh, ik entry of the first matrix, e sub ik, uh, and the kj entry of the second matrix, e sub kj super t, with the super t's on the entries of the transposed matrix. All right, and then you sum those up from k equals one to n, k's x is a dummy variable. Uh, but if we're looking at i, something other than p and q, I have to break it up into cases. If i is something other than p and q, then these e sub i k's, they're gonna be zeros, except when k equals i. So we get e sub i k equals zero for k not equal to i, so we drop all of these except for the one where k equals i to give us an e sub i i and I guess an e sub uh, i j super t. All right, and what's going to happen here? Well, uh, e sub i i, that's one for these values of i. e sub i j super t, well, that's the um, entries in the i throw. Uh, and we stayed away from the P and Q throw. So what are we getting from, so we're getting a one out for E sub I I in this setting, E sub I J, we're getting zeros out if I isn't J and one out if I equals J. So this product leads us to one or zero depending on whether I and J are equal or not. 
So the IJ entry of this matrix product looks exactly like the entries for the identity matrix, zeros and ones in the appropriate place. But that only considered what happens um, in the rows other than P and Q. Of course, it behaves like this. Everything looks like an identity if you stay away from row P and row Q. So next, we'll have to deal with a case of I equals P and I equals Q. When I equals P, the IJ entry, or if you like the um, taking I equals P, it'd be the PJ entry. So we fix that, that first value as P uh, is, okay, usual way. It's the same stuff we had before. You multiply the same way. All right, now when you go through these things uh, and we're looking at the E sub I K's, we're gonna get those E sub I K's, or better yet, E sub P K's, I equals P. So here it is written in a slightly different way. I'll change the I to a P is the only new thing from here to here. E sub P K's, well, uh, those E sub P K's were mostly zeros. The only time we didn't get a zero with E sub P K was when K equals Q. So we're getting zeros out unless K equals Q. E sub P Q was zero. I'm sorry, E sub P Q was one and all the others were zero because we've interchanged those P and Q rows from that original identity matrix. But all these were zeros except when K equals Q. So we get zero, 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 zero. We hit K equals Q, we get E sub P Q, E sub P Q and uh, K equals Q, we'll have E sub Q J, uh, E sub Q J super T. All right. By the way, this E sub P Q, that's one. E sub Q J transpose, uh, we can get rid of the transpose and write it as E sub J Q. And what was up with E sub J Q? Well, we're getting uh, one if J equals P, E sub P Q, that's the one time that we're not getting zeros. And otherwise, other values of the indices, we're getting zeros out. So uh, we're looking along the, if you like, the jth row here uh, and getting zeros out except in the pth entry. Okay, so uh, indeed then in the pth row, the ij entry looks exactly like it should, uh, uh, or the pj entry better yet, looks exactly like it should. Uh, you get zeros out when J doesn't equal P and you get one out when J does equal P as you would expect in an identity matrix. Same thing here. If we look at J equals Q, let me speed it up a wee bit. Uh, so it's the same computation as what we have above. Same observations except P and Q, their roles have sort of switched around. And we still get out the ones and the zeros. So we're looking at the IQ entry. We're getting out zero when I doesn't equal Q and we're getting out one when I does equal Q, exactly like an identity matrix. Previous slide told you when you take the matrix product, E sub P, e sub P Q times E sub P Q transpose. Previous page told you when you stay away from the P throw or the Q throw, you get the identity. This page tells you along the P throw and the Q throw, you also get identity type entries. In other words, this product of matrices is the identity matrix of appropriate dimensions. And when a matrix times its transpose, a square matrix times its transpose equals an identity matrix, then that matrix is orthogonal. Theorem 3.7.1 gave us that. So here's where we are in the proof. A little bit lengthier than the first two from this section. We know that um, Elementary permutation matrices, E sub PQs, that represent swapping P's and Q's rows uh, or columns, depending on whether you multiply on the left or the right. Those are orthogonal matrices. All right. Uh, oh, if we went through and swapped columns, it'd be the same thing. We just, I think we just interchange the indices. It's very similar argument, so let's not bother. But we do have work left to do. If P is a permutation matrix, then it's a product of some sequence of elementary permutation matrices. So every permutation matrix is a product of elementary permutation matrices. This overlaps with maybe some of that stuff we did with determinants 
um, where we made a claim that uh, every permutation in the symmetry group S sub n is a product of transpositions. Uh, these elementary permutation matrices are like transpositions. They transpose uh, two rows or columns at a time. So anyhow, that permutation matrix can be written as some sequence of uh, elementary permutation matrices. All right, so we can represent P as say E1, E2 through E sub L. And the thing is the types of matrices that these E1 through E sub Ls are, they're like E sub PQ. That means they're orthogonal. We've already shown they're orthogonal matrices. All right, so uh, let's look at P transpose. Well, P transpose, I got P written as this product, so we'll take the transpose of that product. You know how transposes interact with products. You write the product down backwards and put transposes on each of the matrices. Okay, uh, Buddha said each of these little E sub one, E sub two, each of these little elementary permutation matrices is known to be orthogonal. We showed that above when we showed it for E sub P, Q. These are like E sub P, Qs. These are E sub P, Qs for some P and some Q. So uh, they are themselves orthogonal and they're square. So uh, E1 transpose equals E1 inverse. That's what theorem 3.7.1 told us. The, the final comment dealing with square matrices. A square matrix is orthogonal if and only if its inverse exists and equals its transpose. All right, these are elementary matrices. These are certainly invertible. So we can replace each of the transposes with an inverse because we know each of those little matrices are orthogonal matrices. Uh, hey, we got uh, a product of a bunch of inverse matrices. As you know, we can write that as an inverse of a product of matrices. You've got to write them in, the, in backwards order. But when you do that, you got E1 times E2 through E sub L. That's what matrix P equals. We got P inverse. We just showed P transpose for an arbitrary permutation matrix equals P inverse. So if we take P times P transpose, it's the same as P times P inverse, gives us an identity matrix. And so as claimed, the permutation matrix, the general permutation matrix P is an orthogonal matrix. Uh, theorem 3.7.1, that final part again from that theorem. All right, um, there's a couple other little observations, uh, some things that are left really as homework. Uh, if A and B are orthogonal, then the Kronecker product of A and B is also orthogonal. Left is an exercise, uh, exercise as I've numbered them, 3.7.A. Uh, it's left as another exercise. I made both of these exercises up. I know because uh, they're labeled with letters, That's stuff I made up. Uh, it can be shown that uh, the set of all n by n orthogonal matrices form a group. That group is called the orthogonal group, uh, denoted uh, O n. So the group of all n by n orthogonal matrices uh, forms a group called an orthogonal group. Um, in your senior level algebra class, even your graduate al level algebra class, you mostly deal with uh, discrete groups. Um, you might deal with infinite groups. If you do, more often than not, it's something related to the integers. Um, but I could treat the reals as a continuous group under a single binary operation. I choose addition to make sure we have inverses of everything. Um, but this gives you a little insight on continuous groups. Uh, the orthogonal groups uh, form a a continuous group whose elements are matrices. You think this is an abelian group? I doubt it. Um, matrix multiplication isn't commutative unless there's something weird in these ortho orthogonal uh, matrices that allows commutivity and there isn't. So uh, this is an example of a continuous group. It's an example of um, a non-abelian group as well, not commutative. Uh, these orthogonal groups uh, pop up in geometric applications. Uh, in notes I've prepared for the senior level topology class we have, 
Uh, there's, a, I think there's a little supplement, there's a little, yeah, supplement to, um, that deals with uh, topological groups. So these groups is a pop up in the setting of a topological space. So that takes care of section 3.7. Uh, next section is on eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, like these last couple of sections because they weren't so long. Mm, section 3.8, the eigen analysis section, it's pretty lengthy. So we'll get on that next. I will see you in section 3.8, eigen analysis.